crowdfunding. That was all about getting off the ground, getting your, your first project or business going. And these, these business owners up here, they got more than one, one location. They got, they got several, well, two, but uh, <laughs> more than one, plural. Um, so this, this panel is expanding your business. And we are with Heidi Shalik, I say it right, from the training room, and Ro Rosie Serna from Machu Picchu, and Angelica from Machu Picchu as well. Um, so if you could briefly um, talk about your business um, before jumping into the questions. Um, sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rosie Serna. I own Machu Picchu Restaurant and Machu Chicken in both locations in Union Square. So um, maybe you might ask him why is to Peruvian restaurants next to each other. So I started right in Union Square, 25 Union Square, like 17 years ago. And um, so um, um, luckily, so people like my food and uh, we, you know, had a high demand. So we um, wanted to open a second location, you know, bigger. But instead of moving um, far away, I just decided to, um, um, looking for something close by because um, Peru offers a lot of um, well a variety of food that I can even feed in one or two or three restaurants. There's a lot of um, we are so blessed to have this variety of products that we can make our Peruvian cuisine very um, um, successful, popular nowadays. And um, so I got the second location, and um, we decided to keep the first one and have it at Chicken Place over there. So that's how we um, ended up having two businesses in Union Square. And um, um, we offer Peruvian cuisine. And uh, not only it's um, the Peruvian dishes, but we also connect with the culture. Um, we offer like live music Friday nights. And um, we also do like events in the restaurant too. So we participate in two in different um, events like the festivals here in Union Square. We've been in um, the 4th of July too in a Memorial Drive. So we go in different towns too to um, promote our Peruvian cuisine. Great. Thank you. <laughs> if you can pass. Um, so I own the training room, um, which is a personal training and fitness studio uh, in Somerville. We have two locations now. Um, and one is right outside of Porter Square on Somerville Ave, and the other one we opened in 2013, and it's on the corner of Washington and Dane, so it's kind of right down from Union Square on the corner um, by like wine and cheese cask and the biscuit and that little area. Um, and we just, we do one-on-one -on -one coaching, small group training, group exercise classes, and some nutrition services, and yeah, that's, all, that's what we do. <laughs> nice. Um, so when did uh, the first location for when when was that for you guys again? Uh, 2009. Okay. We opened the first and you one. were 17 years ago. Yeah, we're like, we can't, I can't compete with 17. I know. We're seven, a little over seven years. Okay. Um, so when did you start having um, what was the kernel or the seed for? Hey, I think we can. This this concept is is connected with the community. Um, let's start thinking about uh, opening a second location. Just natural business growth and needing more space to accommodate more clients. And so that's why we opened it fairly close by as well, because uh, the current clientele that we have wouldn't fit in the space we had. We have, it's 2,700 square feet, the first location. So we you know, opened a second one so we could expand. Got it. So it's kind of a natural. And your, your second location, it's an old auto body shop. It's got that. Yes. The fun garage similar door. To so. <laughs> yeah. Similar to yours. That's right. Um, yeah, it was vacant for. I think 10 or 12 years wow. um, and then the building went up for sale and one of my clients actually is the landlord and he approached me about this and was like you guys should expand what do you think about this and it was the right situation so we went for it great and Rosie you have a unique s situation where didn't you kind of flip-flop um, you were in the can you tell people more your first location was um, it's a little confusing yeah, if you could talk in the mic about. Sure, sorry. Yeah, uh, my first location, we offer like traditional uh, Peruvian dishes, but then I wanted to have the chicken. Um, it's an, it was a new product and um, it's a very uh, popular in Peru. And um, um, 
and what happens is that um, you know every time you know it's always um, you're learning something. But uh, even though I thought I knew the process of opening a second location, and um, um, I find out that I need a special permit for my um, um, rosticity mm. um, oven or machine. So well, we were in the process for like a year, I guess, to comply with all these requirements to be able to use charcoal in a safety way. So. Okay. Yeah. How long were you expect? You weren't expecting a year for it to for it to take a year. Yeah, it took like a year, okay. and um, and not only that, but the the Peruvian spices too that we're using is really hard to find. I mean, nowadays mm -hmm. it's getting easier, but I uh, uh, have to travel like every 15 days to New Jersey to get those products and be able to offer the the oh, wow. the, the traditional flavor of Peru. So. Very authentic. So you're still making that every two weeks. You guys make the trip down uh, there. Not, not now. I'm glad that we have um, supplies. Um, yep. I mean, yeah. No, no now. But uh, I think I stopped traveling like four years ago. But I've been doing like twelve years most. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of. So it's not the the process doesn't seem like it gets. Uh, it's small business is still hard, even though you you did it the first time and you have those learnings. It's still. Is there anything that you um, the second go around, you you kind of knew some of your blind spots or knew what to look out for. Going um, into it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. In a way, yes, um, it was easy. Again, you know, the first time is always hard, um, especially I'm not from this country and coming here and find out about the process and requirements and regulations and um, being training on like self safe certifications and stuff like that. Um, but at the second time, obviously, when you know what you're doing, and um, it's easier, always, yeah. Less difficult. Yeah, less. less How about you, for you, Heidi? Um, well, in terms of it being easier the, the second, second time around? The second location, just that process. I think uh, it was, we definitely knew what to expect, and it was a little bit easier. Um, and we, in the beginning, we, the first location, we did all the work ourselves. My dad flew in. We... <laughs> Like took took two or three weeks and just like demoed and painted and did all the work ourselves. In the second location, you know, we we hired people to do things and it was just it was smoother. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, you you pretty much need a special permit for anything if you're changing use or variance or something like that. So you just want to scope all that out on the front end so that I'll, you're prepared. <laughs> yeah, because um, we had to we had to do that as well and we had to get all kinds of environmental testing because it was an auto body shop. So like clearance from the city that it wasn't contaminated grounds and like you know they had to do a full report mm -hmm. so, so getting the location ready is one thing or, or doing that but how about scaling up your your teams um how big are your your teams at this point and how um there's the team leader right there just walked in um <laughs> it's okay uh so this is Tyler, our manager, um, and our, we have 14 full-time personal trainers on staff, and then we have um, me and my business partner, Marin, who's not here. She's uh, taking the summer off to travel, um, but Tyler and the rest of the coaches, and then a couple of cycling-only instructors. Okay. So it's grown. Yeah. And is that, that partnership uh, really helpful? Like the, the earlier panel, it was all about having kind of a companion to lean on and help you through the the process. Absolutely. It's been really great. And the one of our challenges is always communication. So uh, communicating and appreciating what the other person brings to the table is very important. Um, distributing tax, tasks evenly and stuff like that. But it's been good to have her and it's been great to have. I mean, you have to hire good staff and empower them to do their job. And uh, so we have been really lucky and fortunate with staffing. Cool. How about you? How about you, Rosie? Just uh, how how big is your team at this point, and oh, how um, do you um, how do you manage all the moving moving parts? Um, oh, we grow definitely. We started with six um, employees, so now we are like twenty eight. Yeah, I think it, yeah we have like twenty eight employees, and um, yeah, well, um, I'm really happy because most of them are from the beginning with me. <laughs> So um, I think that the best important is, um, um, you know, training really well and then, you know, trade them well so 
they don't have, they, they, they won't leave you. But um, it's not easy. Again, she said the communication, communication is really difficult. And for us, I think it's um, more like because I, I hire people from that they have knowledge about cuisine, but no one like Peruvian, especially because it wasn't like so um, well known now. But um, um, it, it, that was the most difficult part, just training and get to know the products and, you know, because we're using a authentic Peruvian product, so people don't know what it is, so it takes a little bit of time for them, but um, once they get it, I mean, they're, I mean, we're trying to teach them the best that we can so they can make it, you know, right. Mm -hmm. Can you, uh, can you guys share any missteps or mistakes that you, that you've made that would help, help other people that are trying to get something off the ground? Oh, do you want to start it? <laughs> <laughs> you, you haven't made any mistakes. Um, I, com honestly, communication has been our biggest downfall. Like, not, not that we don't get along, but just making sure that you make time to uh, meet regularly, to just check in, to have staff meetings, to over-communicate, because if there's ever been a breakdown, it's when you know, someone claims they didn't know what was going on or someone doesn't feel like their work is being appreciated or we don't, you know, I don't know what he's doing all day and he doesn't know what I'm doing all day because we're both so busy. Um, and that, that has just led, that one thing has led to any sort of issues that we've had. <laughs> so now we'd really make a point to just over communicate, over communicate and be upfront about things. Um, and it's, it's good, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to add anything? Yeah. You know, I think some, I'm Tyler, by the way, hello, everyone. Um, I think some, some downfalls we've had, like I mentioned, communication, trust, you know, I think, I think that the ability to not always micromanage every situation, it can be tough sometimes because you know that you can do that situation uh, really well, but, but you can't do everything. So allowing people to, to kind of grow into their roles and, uh, and have trust in them to do um, the job well has been tough, but something that we've learned and in regards to communication, be direct. So if, if something happens, handling it right away and letting them know what the expectation is and, and, uh, and what you're looking for um, from them going forward has been really important because at times, I know when I first started in this role, I thought, all right, if I lead by example, then, uh, then everyone will just fall into place and it'll be really easy. Um, but, but the, and and that has, for the most part, that's been the case, but there is times where I think um, a situation presents itself and you just have to let them know this is what we're looking for and, 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 uh, and with that, right from the beginning, deal with it. And it, it makes it a much easier thing to handle opposed to letting something go and then it builds bigger and bigger and before you know it, um, it becomes a tougher conversation to have opposed to in the beginning if you just handle it then, it was nice and easy. So those are the couple of things that I can add. Rose, Rosie hasn't made any mistakes. Oh None. yeah, a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, well, yeah, I guess um, one of the things that was the same, like communication, because my employees come from different countries, and sometimes our, we speak Spanish, but um, uh, it doesn't mean the same thing from country to mm -hmm. country, it's just the differences. So, you know, sometimes I ask my employees to cut it, but now they know me, they, they learn a lot, but um, before, you know, I, you know, I assign a task the way that I want to do it and maybe I use my Peruvian language and they don't know what to do. They don't want to f make them feel like they don't know what they're doing so just, just they figure it out and do it. But I, um, you know, so there is, I, I learned that, that um, it's a, it, I can't believe it that, you know, we're speaking the same one language but we have different, you know, words that mean in different meanings. So um, that was one of the thing. And then um, when concerning to the job task, I guess um, what I what I do is just give them um, each of each of the areas, you know, the kitchen, the the front of the house. We give the task how to do things, and, and especially when we have catering orders, um, you know, I, I think we're pretty well organized. But uh, it's always we have to give them, give them, it, you know, like like the task what they need to do. Um, one day I think I forgot it because I thought that they know what to do. So, and apparently, even though they work for so many years with me, they, they don't do it. So you have to always like be on top of that and always. Over communicate. Yeah. Even though, yeah, yeah over communicate. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
what's uh bad pun what's what's cooking in the future for uh for your businesses is it it's more locations more services um just oh. getting better at more efficient more productive at your, at your existing <laughs> locations yeah definitely i would love to um you know spend macho chicken um it's easy operation than the other place and um why is, why is it easier than the other uh, because location. we have like a short menu and the other one has like 60 dishes and the <laughs> menu and the other one is just like 30 and uh, it's um, and the operational way it's easier and um, people like it too and um, but definitely that's what I want to see like is that uh, is that a food truck is it more brick and mortar is it for the machu chicken for the machu chicken yeah um, well, you don't have to share all your secrets, but <laughs> I think we're, everyone's just curious. What was it? I'm sorry. For Machu Chicken, the, would, it, would, it be a, would it be a truck? You know, would, would oh, it be mobile? Would no, it be another more, actual more location? Locations. Okay. Yeah, like more locations. And definitely, um, I would like to give the opportunity so people can try new stuff, homemade food. So mm -hmm. that's my dream. <laughs> yeah. And you're, can you... T um, your husband, uh, he opened, oh, really? didn't he open oh. a, he went all the way to, to El Salvador. El Salvador. Yeah, okay. he's from El Salvador. He really wanted to have um, yeah, a restaurant running in El Salvador. So, but he's in the food course, so he's opening his second location um, in next month. Okay. So, yeah, we're expanding the business to El Salvador. I, I, I think it wasn't a good idea in my side because it's not easy to manage a restaurant if you're not there, I mean, but uh, he's trying his best. I'm trying too because I'm on myself and running the two restaurants. But uh, you know, it's kind of difficult. But uh, I definitely want to spend macho chicken, but here in Boston. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Heidi, what about what about you guys? Um, I'm always on the lookout for opportunities. <laughs> uh, so I check out spaces that are vacant all the time. I go and like meet with landlords and. That's how I met you, is I was just nosy. On I was by nosy, and I was like, what is going on? <laughs> this better not be competition. Um, so <laughs> I'm always on the lookout, but it has to be the right opportunity at this point. Like, I'm not in a rush to just open more locations for the sake of opening them. Um, we're trying to get more involved in Somerville youth programs. Um, mm -hmm. So we've been doing some stuff this summer with the youth softball team, and we'd like to do more, like, youth training and team coaching and stuff like that. Um, and maybe physical therapy someday. Um, I think it's good to integrate. Like right now we refer out to people. Um, we have a good referral system and network of people that we refer out to, but offering those types of complementary services in-house mm -hmm. can be really good for our clients because then we can communicate with their physical therapist and continue their training program. So um, that's definitely something that's in my mind, but no, no concrete plans to just open a TR3. Got it. That's scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For for people that haven't been in the training room, it's um, you guys used to work at one of you were at Boston Sports Club. We both worked you at Boston Sports Club. You saw an opportunity to say, club. rather than the membership model. Right well, at the time, in when we started hatching the idea in like 2006, seven maybe, um, there wasn't really anything like it around in this area in terms of just boutique fitness where you could go and not have a membership but pay per class or just do personal training, but not also have to pay for a membership. Um, so it was kind of new to the area at the time. And then now since there have been a lot of other studios that have opened up that kind of specialize in different things. Um, but yeah, we used to work at Boston Sports Club and, and left. <laughs> Tyler used to work at Boston Sports Club as well. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people did. Um, got to got to know the exist you know what's what's the existing product or competition to and just improve upon it. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's a completely different model. Like yeah. we're we're not trying to gather people's money based on membership and just a commitment to like oh I'm going to sign up and pay this much a month but never go. But I don't want to cancel because I feel really guilty if I cancel. So I'm just going to keep paying these monthly dues. Um, I feel like that happens with a lot of gym memberships. People have good intentions and then. If they don't go, then there's no accountability, there's no follow-up. So with us, you use everything you pay for. Like, mm -hmm. you pay for what you use. If you're not coming in, you don't pay for it. So we get really good client retention and results that way. Um, Great. Yeah. Um, can we open it up to the audience? 
Questions for Heidi and Rosie? Matt, you have a question. Somebody? No. Um, right here. Oh, hi, Leah. So luckily, because they're less than a mile apart, all of the trainers and the coaches, they work at both locations. And the system is so that when you log on, you can see both locations and you can see where someone's working and where they, so they can just bounce back and forth during the day. Um, and in terms of managing it, um, my business partner, Marin, she is primarily at the first location, I'm primarily at the second location, and we kind of split our days. So she's a morning person. I am not a morning person, um, so it works out well. She's doing the stuff in the morning, and then she's done by you know, early afternoon, and then I come in and I finish at night. So that, that just worked out well. Thrilling presentation, I know. How, uh, <laughs> you, um, just Somerville as a whole, what, um, you know, the specialness and uniqueness of, of running a business in Somerville. Can you talk about that? I know you're on Somerville Local First Board. Yeah. Um, just how you're being a both a, a resident and a, a business owner, what that means um, to you. I just think it's a great community. I mean, that, this is, we decided to open our business here. Um, glad that we've stayed here. There's just so much going on and so many cool, funky arts and independent businesses and festivals and good music scene and great restaurants. It's just a really good, great place to be. And actually, all of our staff, I think, is there anyone that doesn't live in Somerville? Maybe Rob. But, yeah, a couple, couple of the new guys don't because um, they're still in school or whatever. But everyone that works for us also lives in Somerville. So it's just very walkable. Everyone bikes everywhere. Big fan of Somerville. Huge range, actually. We train... A few, like even 12 to 14-year-old uh, kids for sports-specific stuff. Um, and then we have, I think our oldest client is in his mid-80s, Martin. I don't know if he's coming in frequently anymore, but we have just a huge range of one-on-one -on -one clients. And then for classes, it's mostly, I would say, early 20s to like late 30s predominantly. But we get a lot of 45 to 65 too, actually. I mean, it's, it's, it's become quite a mix. And it's a, it's a big mix of male and female clients as well. Um, traditionally, if you think of group exercise and you think of like maybe Zumba or body aerobics or something, <laughs> body pump. Um, but we do kettlebell training, we do strength training, circuit training, weightlifting. And so we have a lot of, uh, like a really good variety of clients mixed. All right. Rosie, what's the, Rosie, what's the one item on the, Machu menu that people have to have to have that have never been. Oh, sour ceviche. <laughs> the Peruvian ceviche is fresh. It's made it with um, uh, broiled fish and cooking lime juices with um, Peruvian spices, marinade, marinated in Peruvian spices. And um, definitely that's one of my favorite. <laughs> in, in Peru, too, it's one of the most traditional dishes okay. um, from Peru. W the, um, which one? The pobre. Oh, the pobre? Yeah, yeah, that's, we have, um, yeah, macho chicken is more like, you know, the, the rosticity chicken, and we have some sandwiches and some grills, um, and then macho beach is more like traditional homemade recipes from, yeah. A little more group. formal and sit down, yeah. Yeah, it's more informal, sit down, and um, we do a lot of um, um, catering events too, so. Great. Yep. And like the earlier panelists, where physic, physical locations, where can people find you? And then online, where's the best place for updates and um, staying in the loop? All right. Uh, so we are right here in Union Square, 25 Union Square for Machu Chicken. And Machu Picchu Restaurant, it's at 307 Somerville Avenue. And um, our website, Machu Chicken Boston, Machu Picchu Boston .com. Same as the, we have Facebook. And, um, same, Machu Picchu, Machu Chicken, Boston. Great. Yeah, I think I've already went over the locations, but right on Washington Street and then right outside of, uh, of Porter Square on Somerville Ave. 
and it's thetrainingroomboston.com, and all the info is on there. And we're, I'm not the greatest social media person ever. I'm not even on Facebook myself, um, but we try to keep up with Facebook, Twitter. We have Instagram. Our Instagram's probably has the most activity, I would say. Um, yeah. Got to show those kettlebell. Yeah. Kettlebell workouts, right? Yes, yes. Um, and we also, I should say, because Leah's at the Armory, um, that we have an event this weekend, um, the Somerville Local First event. Can I say that? Sure. A little plug for Get it. Get it out there. Um, so tons of local artists and uh, just community people and musicians and the Armory and everyone's getting together to do a big event on Sunday. So definitely swing by. There's a brunch. There's a band. Uh, the truck drive-in neighbors downstairs. They do Porch Fest and they do... Um, like classic country and 50s and 60s standards. They're really good. Uh, and then lots of cool stuff to look at, art Sweet. to buy. What time is that from? 11 to 4. And nice. Run Fellow, um, a local community run club, is doing a run. Oh, yeah. And we're also doing a strength training for runners seminar. One of our coaches, who's a big-time runner and strength coach, is doing a free informational strength training lecture at 10 a.m. So, yeah, try to swing by. Big can. Sunday. Yeah, it's a big Sunday. All right. Thanks, Heidi and Rosie. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. <laughs>